Well, it's been an amazing week this past week. Here we are on the May 25th ep uh, episode of North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. Thanks for watching. We have had a very, very busy week in, uh, af in affairs. And I'm not just talking about foreign affairs. I'm also talking stuff domestically. Uh, the Minnesota legislature supposed to have adjourned. They did adjourn until like February 20th. However, they could not come up with an agreement with Governor Dayton until the last moments of the session. And then they immediately went into a special session and things have been stalled ever since. So we're still not done with the 2017 Minnesota legislative session. So we're not gonna give you an update on that other than to tell you that the governor keeps stonewalling and stonewalling and stonewalling. Uh, it would be nice that we can actually get the business of the state done during the legislative session, which is what the, uh, the uh, founders have intended. For some strange reason, Governor Dayton has figured out that if he does not negotiate in good faith with the legislators at the Capitol until the very, very last minutes, then he can get what he wants in a special, special session. This happens every single year. This is his next to last legislative session. So perhaps after the 2018 election, it'll be nice to get some normalcy back in St. Paul. This uh, also was the final curtain for the greatest show on earth as Feld Entertainment has shut down the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. They made that the initial announcement back in December and May 21st on Sunday, was their final performance. So here's a look back at Sunday's show. It's incredibly heartwarming to see all of you that have come out for the final performance of Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey. <laughs> On behalf of the entire Feld family, we not only want to thank you for coming out tonight, but for all the support that you have given Ringling Brothers over the years. coming on out tonight to this historic occasion. It brings such joy to children, such joy through generations, which is what I've been. And to see it end like this, it is very heartbreaking. Uh, the last time I was here, I was uh, eight years old. I'm 43 now, so I wanted to make sure that you know I came out one more time with the kids and you know uh, see it for the last time. And so, what a show it was. 146 years started when the Barnum Circus started on uh, Fulton Street in Brooklyn on April 10th, 1871. And it concluded on Long Island, New York on May 21st, 2017. In my heart of hearts, I still hold out hope that somebody will actually buy the rights to the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. Um, 
it's a pipe dream of mine. I hope it continues, but for now, that was it. That's all she wrote. And since we have a busy episode, we're going to go right to our Prager University segment following the Paris Climate Agreement and how it will not change the climate because there's some news that came out about that this morning. Much has been made of the Paris Climate Agreement signed by the leaders of 178 countries in 2016. French Foreign Minister Laurent Fabius, speaking for many, called it a historic turning point. The head of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Gina McCarthy, echoed the minister's remark when she testified before the House Committee on Science, Space and Technology. The Paris Agreement was, she said, an incredible achievement. But when pressed by committee members to explain exactly how much this treaty would reduce global temperatures, she would not, or could not, say. This combination of grand pronouncements and vague specifics is a good strategy for Paris Agreement fans to take because the agreement will cost a fortune but do little to reduce global warming. Consider the Obama administration's signature climate policy, the Clean Power Plan. Using the same climate prediction model that the UN uses, I found that the power plan will accomplish almost nothing. Even if its cuts to carbon dioxide emissions are fully implemented, not just for the 14 years that the Paris Agreement lasts, but for the rest of the century, the Clean Power Plan would reduce the temperature increase in 2100 by just 0.023 degrees Fahrenheit. The President has made further and grander promises of future U.S. carbon cuts, but these are only vaguely outlined. In the unlikely event that all of these extra cuts also happen and are adhered to throughout the rest of the century, the combined reduction in temperatures would be 0.057 degrees. To put it another way, if the U.S. delivers for the whole century on the President's very ambitious rhetoric, it would postpone global warming by about eight months at the end of the century. Now, let's add in the rest of the world's Paris promises. If we generously assume that the promised carbon cuts for 2030 are not only met, which itself would be a UN first, but sustained throughout the rest of the century, temperatures in 2100 would drop by 0.3 degrees, the equivalent of postponing warming by less than four years. Again, that's using the UN's own climate prediction model. But here's the biggest problem. These minuscule benefits do not come free. Quite the contrary. The cost of the Paris Climate Pact is likely to run to one to two trillion dollars every year based on estimates produced by the Stanford Energy Modeling Forum and the Asia Modeling Exercise. In other words, we will spend at least $100 trillion in order to reduce the temperature by the end of the century by a grand total of three-tenths of one degree. Some Paris Agreement supporters defend it by claiming that its real impact on temperatures will be much more significant than the UN model predicts. But this requires mental gymnastics and heroic assumptions. The Climate Action Tracker, widely cited by Paris Agreement fans, predict a temperature reduction of 1.6 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century. But this prediction is based very heavily on the assumption that even stronger climate policies will be adopted in the future. Actually, 98% of the assumed reductions will come only after 2030, which is what the current Paris Agreement covers. And even such wishful thinking won't achieve anything close to the 2 degrees Celsius reduction that has become the somewhat arbitrary but widely adopted benchmark to avoid the worst effects of global warming. The actual promised emission reductions under the Paris Agreement literally gets us just 1% of the way to the 2 degrees target. 99% of what would be required is put off until after 2030. The Paris Agreement is the wrong solution to a real problem. The right solution will most likely be found through green energy research and development, like that promoted by Bill Gates and the Breakthrough Coalition. Mr. Gates has announced that private investors are committing $7 billion for clean energy R&D. 
Instead of political hot air and ever larger government subsidies of today's inefficient green technologies, those who want to combat climate change should focus on dramatically boosting green energy innovation. The U.S. already shows the way. With its pursuit of fracking, making it safer and more efficient every year, America has drastically reduced the cost of natural gas. This momentous switch from coal to lower CO2 gas as a source of energy has done far more to drive down carbon dioxide emissions than any recent government climate policy. Turns out that those politicians who gathered in Paris, France, could learn a lot from Paris, Texas. I'm Bjorn Lomborg, president of the Copenhagen Consensus Center. So now that you know a little bit more about the Paris Climate Agreement, that sets the background for a letter that was uh, submitted to President Trump today, May 25th, by, uh, and it was uh, released by Oklahoma Senator James Inhofe. So I'm going to, it's a pretty short letter, and it has to deal with the Paris Climate Agreement, and I'm going to read Senator Inhofe's letter. Dear President Trump, we have been encouraged by the steps you have taken to reduce the regulatory burdens facing this country. From your many executive orders to the signing of 14 laws rolling back regulations from the previous administration, it is clear you shared the commitment to reducing the regulatory burden our businesses face in order to create jobs and grow the economy. One of the most important executive orders you signed is Executive Order 13783, promoting energy independence and economic growth wherein, among other things, you instruct the Environmental Protection Agency to unwind President Obama's Clean Power Plan regulations. We applaud this objective and encourage you to take every action necessary to ensure it is accomplished. A key risk to fulfilling this objective is remaining in the Paris Agreement. Because of existing provisions within the Clean Air Act and others embedded in the Paris Agreement, remaining in it would subject the United States to significant litigation risk that could upend your administration's ability to fulfill its goals of rescinding the Clean Power Plan. Accordingly, we strongly encourage you to make a clean break from the Paris Agreement. Section 115 of the Clean Air Act addresses the regulatory steps the United States must take to address international air pollution. EPA and state government regulatory action of a pollutant are mandated after two tests are met. One, a finding is established that a pollutant from the U.S. is endangering the public health or welfare of another country. And two, it is determined that the endangered country gives the U.S. the same rights to prevent or control pollution from that country. Under the previous administration, EPA issued an endangerment finding for greenhouse gases and then pursued the Clean Power Plan. Many environmentalists already believe that this finding is broad enough to meet the endangerment test under Section 115, they, and they would certainly make this argument in court as they fight your efforts to rescind the Clean Power Plan rulemaking. Environmentalists will argue that these Section 115 requirements are, in fact, met more easily by the Paris Agreement because it includes enhanced transparency requirements in Article 13, which, is, which establishes a process for nations to submit plans to reduce emissions to one another and then to comment on the plans of one another. Leading environmental attorneys have been candid that they intend to use the Paris Agreement and the existing endangerment finding to force EPA to regulate under Section 115 of the Clean Air Act. David Bookbinder, formerly chief counsel of the Sierra Club, stated that together the Paris Agreement and Section 115 are the silver bullet du jour of the enviros, and their intent to use it is real. New York and Vermont attorneys general recently wrote to their colleagues that, quote, states must still play a crucial or critical role in ensuring that the promises made in Paris become a reality, end quote. With statements like this, it is clear that those advocating for greenhouse gas regulations will use the Paris Agreement as a legal defense against your actions to rescind the Clean Power Plan if you decide to remain in the Paris Agreement. This is why it is so important for you to make a clean exit from the agreement. We understand that some officials inside your administration want to remain in the Paris Agreement to keep a seat at the table so that the U.S. continues to have a voice in future discussions. Fortunately, a clean exit from the Paris Agreement will not take this away. 
The Senate gave its consent to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1992. This treaty provides a permanent seat at the table for the United States to engage with other countries each year at the Conference of Parties. In fact, it was through an annual COP meeting in Paris that the Paris Agreement was signed. This permanent seat at the table enabled President Obama to negotiate this deal. The seat remains and will enable you to continue discussions with other nations on this topic should you choose to do so. Again, we applaud you for your ongoing efforts to reduce overregulation in America. To continue on this path, we encourage you to make a clean exit from the Paris Agreement so that your administration can follow through on its commitment to rescind the Clean Power Plan. Sincerely, and it was signed not just by Senator James Inhofe, but by John Barrasso, Mitch McConnell, John Cornyn, Roy Blunt, Roger Wicker, Mike Enzi, Michael Crapo, Jim Risch, Thad Cochran, M. Michael Rounds, Rand Paul, John Boozman, Richard Shelby, Luther Strange, Orrin Hatch, Mike Lee, Ted Cruz, David Perdue, Tom Tillis, Tim Scott, and Pat Roberts, 22 Republican United States Senators. Uh, it would have been kind of nice if Senators Klobuchar and Franken would have signed that as well, but we know that they don't believe in uh, uh, real science when it comes to the climate, and they want to continue with UN and Paris Agreement conventions, which, as you've seen on the uh, Prager U segment, is just going to cost a lot of money for you, and we will not get any results, and probably not in our lifetime, if at all. So that's what happened today. The Republicans have asked President Trump to back out of the Paris Climate Agreement, and I hope to hear a response from President Trump soon and I hope he says yes that's the right because it's the right thing to do speaking of President Trump he was in his very first official foreign visit as president of the United States uh, this past week and we're going to go a little bit more in depth on that now um, so we're going to start off just with a brief explanation on his visit to Saudi Arabia President Donald Trump arrived in Saudi Arabia today for his first overseas visit as president. Saudi Arabia is ecstatic about being the first choice of the president. King Salman greeted President Donald Trump in Riyadh on the tarmac to a very long red carpet. For Saudi Arabia, cementing ties with the United States under President Trump is essential in this visit. Those ties were strained under President Barack Obama and his outreach to Iran, which is the kingdom's rival in the region. For President Donald Trump, securing multi-billion dollar weapons deals with Saudi Arabia and one of the world's largest oil producers will also be key on this visit. He'll be meeting with King Sunman and holding bilateral talks with the first in line to the throne and the second in line to the throne. He'll also be having an equally packed schedule tomorrow. President Trump is expected to deliver a speech to the Muslim world from Riyadh and the kingdom has invited heads of state from across the Muslim world to Saudi Arabia to meet with the president. It's an opportunity for Saudi Arabia to show its strength, its reach, and its weight in the Muslim world. Reporting from Dubai United Arab Emirates, this is Aya Batrawi for the Associated Press. And that was what happened. I believe that was on Saturday. And so President Trump went to Saudi Arabia. The United States and Saudi Arabia have actually been allies since 1933. Uh, that's really when the U.S. finally had recognized Saudi Arabia after 30 years of the Saudis trying and then in the 1940s in World War II the uh, partnership even became even more strategic and important for both sides so the whole Saudi US relationship it goes way back and so it's nice to see a president actually go there and try to you know work with Saudi Arabia on becoming an, a strong ally again. The previous administration ended up um, isolating Saudi Arabia with the um, Iran deal. Iran was not, or Saudi Arabia was not happy with the way that went down with the, um, the attempt at normalizing things with Iran. And so now President Trump goes to Saudi Arabia. He spent about two and a half days there. I think that's a record for a U.S. president visiting Saudi Arabia. And I will say that I have actually been to Saudi Arabia twice, uh, but they were only for hours at a time. Uh, President Trump has spent more hours on Saudi soil than I have uh, back when I was still in the Air Force. So how do the Saudis welcome the president? 
with a sword dance. Check this out. And I will have to say that I'm sure the Secret Service had a field day with, with that, with all those swords around. Now, in all, in all tru uh, truth and honesty, that most likely those swords were probably pretty blunt. Uh, not blunt, but um, dull. Um, I'm sure that the participants were vetted very closely. But still, um, I think for President Trump, uh, it was probably one of the most amazing experiences of his life. So now... Saudi Arabia also went one step further and they gave President Trump a medal. And so that was the award. It was a gold medal. Uh, and of course, it's Saudi Arabia and Donald Trump. Everybody there has gold. I mean, I swear that's just the standard color now. I mean, anything with, with Saudi and, and Trump, have, it just has to be gold. Uh, but that, I guess, was a golden moment. So now uh, the president and uh, the Saudi uh, king or uh, prince um, signed an agreement. So let's take a look at that video.
That was a well, not only was uh, the historic agreement signed, but there was something else that happened on this visit that I think is important to note. Uh, a few months ago, maybe about a year ago, uh, first daughter Ivanka Trump and uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel, they had pu uh, pushed an initiative called the, I've got it here, um, it is a women's, Unfortunately, I did not write it down. It is a women's uh, entrepreneurship uh, fund. Uh, that is, they, they pushed it to the World Bank. And so Ivanka Trump was invited to an event by Saudi Princess Rima Bint Bendar, a retail executive, women's sports promoter, divorced mother, and social activist who has emerged as the leading voice for women's rights in that socially conservative country. And the World Bank President uh, Jim Yong Kim had announced that Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates have pledged a combined $100 million towards a proposed $1 billion Global Women's Entrepreneurship Fund that is managed by the World Bank and that was proposed by Merkel and Ivanka Trump. Mind you that Ivanka Trump does not have any fiduciary interest in this and she does not control it, but that was an idea she had, and she worked with Merkel, and they pitched the World Bank on that idea, and now Saudi, and, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates have combined $100 million, 10% of that $1 billion goal. I think that's a significant thing as well. And it is huge, uh, it's a huge victory for women's rights, and that, happened during this trip. Um, so after the first day, what did Donald Trump say about his experience? That was a tremendous day. I just want to thank everybody, but tremendous investments into the United States and our military uh, community is very happy and we want to thank you and Saudi Arabia. But uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of investments into the United States and jobs, jobs, jobs. So I would like to thank all of the people of Saudi Arabia. And I would also like to thank Rex. And Rex is going to go now with you folks and have a news conference. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Today. And he and President Trump mentioned Rex, Rex Tillerson, U.S. Secretary of State, is going to have a press conference. So we're going to go right to Rex Tillerson's press conference. Here's what the Secretary of State had to say. Today truly is a historic moment in U.S.-Saudi relations. The United States of America, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, are really dedicating ourselves to a new strategic partnership, new for the 21st century, and to charting a renewed path toward a peaceful Middle East where economic development, trade, diplomacy are hallmarks of the regional and global engagement and something that we will be working closely together on. The elements of this declaration that was signed today, the Joint Strategic Vision, there are many, many elements. And there's a lot of work now to implement those elements and really put them into motion. And the United States of America, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, are embarking on a number of new initiatives to counter violent extremist messaging. We're also going to be pursuing new approaches to disrupting financing of terrorism and advancing defense cooperation. Today, the United States and Saudi Arabia are conducting vital new expansions of security relationship that really spans over seven decades. But I think one of the real hallmarks of today is the economic cooperation. Today, we announced uh, 23 foreign investment export licenses, leading to upwards of more than $350 billion of historic direct investment. $109 billion of that is in arms sales to bolster the security of our Saudi partners. And these are going to result in literally hundreds of thousands of American jobs uh, created by these direct investments in purchases of American goods, American uh, equipment, American technology, but also investment into the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia as well. Here's the thing. Here is the thing. Saudi Arabia makes a lot of money. 
They make a lot of money from oil. Oil, because of the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944, is traded in dollars. What does Saudi Arabia do with those dollars? They buy military hardware. They buy F-22s or F-16s back in 1979. They buy new military equipment. They spend hundreds of billions of dollars with the United States from their oil revenues, and that ends up employing tens or hundreds of thousands of American workers at good pay. I have an uncle who used to work for Boeing aircraft in Wichita, Kansas. And back when he was working for them, he was making really good money. Boeing and McDonnell Douglas, uh, Martin Marietta, all of these defense contractors, they don't just make money on the United States. Lockheed Martin. Uh, I remember going to the Lockheed Martin uh, assembly plant number six in Marietta, Georgia, 1999. I toured that uh, plant. Never thought I'd ever see a golden aircraft. And yes, it was golden because that was the uh, color of the primer. And uh, what was told, explained to me was when they do the final inspection, gold is the one color that can determine whether or not the fuselage has been, uh, been scratched. So if there's any type of white marking, then they know that it's been scratched. Gold is the only color that can do that. That, uh, that was news to me. But it was a beautiful sight to see all of these golden aircraft. But the fact is, the aircraft we were looking at, that was actually C-130J, uh, an extended model, that was heading to Great Britain. Royal Air Force, they bought the contract for there. The United States contracts ends up developing this, but what happens? We still get a lot of money on legal arms sales with our allies. And so Saudi Arabia will pump the oil, sell the oil on the open market, convert those dollars into military equipment, and hire a bunch of people. And they're our allies. So that's what happened with this particular agreement. And there's a reason why Saudi is a key partner in the region. And President Trump meeting in front of uh, leaders from other Arab and Muslim nations spelled it out why. And we're just going to do the next two clips back to back. I stand before you as a representative of the American people to deliver a message of friendship and hope and love. That is why I chose to make my first foreign visit a trip to the heart of the Muslim world, to the nation that serves as custodian of the two holiest sites in the Islamic faith. In my inaugural address to the American people, I pledge to strengthen America's oldest friendships and to build new partnerships in pursuit of peace. I also promise that America will not seek to impose our way of life on others, but to outstretch our hands in the spirit of cooperation and trust. Our vision is one of peace security and prosperity in this region and all throughout the world. Our goal is a coalition of nations who share the aim of stamping out extremism and providing our children a hopeful future that does honor to God. And so this historic and unprecedented gathering of leaders unique in the history of nations, is a symbol to the world of our shared resolve in our military that will protect the safety of our people and enhance the security of our wonderful friends and allies, many of whom are here today. Terrorists do not worship God. They worship death. If we do not act against this organized terror, then we know 
what will happen and what will be the end result. Terrorism's devastation of life will continue to spread. Peaceful societies will become engulfed by violence. And the futures of many generations will be sadly squandered. If we do not stand in uniform condemnation of this killing, then not only will we be judged by our people, not only will we be judged by history, but we will be judged by God. This is not a battle between different faiths, different sects, or different civilizations. This is a battle between barbaric criminals who seek to obliterate human life and decent people, all in the name of religion people that want to protect life and want to protect their religion. This is a battle between good and evil. We must be united in pursuing the one goal that transcends every other consideration. That goal is to meet history's great test, to conquer extremism and vanquish the forces that terrorism brings with it every single time. Young Muslim boys and girls should be able to grow up free from fear, safe from violence, and innocent of hatred. If we are going to defeat terrorism and send its wicked ideology into oblivion, the first task in this joint effort is for your nations to deny all territory to the foot soldiers of evil. Every country in the region has an absolute duty to ensure that terrorists find no sanctuary on their soil. I am proud to announce that the nations here today will be signing an agreement to prevent the financing of terrorism called the Terrorist Financing Targeting Center. Here's the thing. Donald Trump talked really, really tough, but he got to the heart of the matter. And if you've watched, and I didn't mention it yet, uh, and you can check out our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash North Star Oasis, or our Facebook channel, facebook.com slash North Star Oasis. We are in the middle of a long series about U.S. involvement in the Middle East and Central Asia. And I'm not going to go through all of what we've covered so far, other than to say that if you've been watching the show, you should understand by now, and we've, you know, and we've covered it, so if, you, if this is the first time you're tuning in, please go to our Facebook or YouTube channel, watch that series, because this is the stuff that you don't hear anywhere else, and it's all true. If you go back, most of our conflicts were involving states. Even Desert Shield, Desert Storm, that involved the U.S., Saudi Arabia, a multinational coalition versus the Iraqi army. We were not fighting an ideology or a religion. Go back through the Iran-Iraq war, and it was the same thing there. It was a state versus state matter. The Soviet invasion of Afghanistan was a state versus state matter. It was not until the introduction of Wahhabism that we started getting a perversion of Islam. Look at it this way for Christians. If the Westboro Baptist Church, which has picketed funerals, especially of service members, if they represent all of Christianity, and you're a Christian, you'd kind of cringe at that, wouldn't you? But the Wahhabists represent about the same percentage or less of Muslims. There are clear differences between Christianity and Islam. There's no doubt about that. But if you have a sect that does not represent the mainstream, that's where the problem is. And the Islamic and the Arabic leaders understand that, those differences. And there's no doubt in my mind that uh, Secretary of Defense James Mattis probably had a lot to do with influencing President Trump's remarks. I mean, I look up to Mattis as a historian. The guy knows his stuff. 
But the fact is, if you're going to set a new tone and you want to reach out to these leaders, you have to have it in terms that they can understand. That, surprisingly, is something that Barack Obama was never able to do. Uh, here we have talking about good versus evil and talking about God, not completely or not in a uh, derogatory tone either. Uh, unfortunately, that's the way the previous president always carried himself, like he knew everything and nobody else knew anything. And, you know, with, with Trump, I think it's really refreshing to see a different tone, but still get to the heart of the matter. What is going to happen out of this? I don't know. I don't know how those in attendance at, the, at that particular summit felt about his remarks. Will these nations speak out against the uh, Wahhabists and you know, the terrorist ISIS? Don't know. We're going to find out as time goes on. But I do think that that set the proper tone for discussing security in that region, especially with U.S. involvement over there. Uh, so President Trump did one last thing, and it's national security related, uh, before he left Saudi Arabia. Let's take a look. I work as a content developer. We develop videos, infographics, and motion graphics to combat extremist content. I'm Mohammed. I'm a director of the National Security Council. We are working with 100 television networks in the world in different languages and to translate them into the next and to translate them to the best way and the best way. Further action. I'm Abdul Aziz. I'm a professor. So what you are seeing is the opening of uh, the counterterrorism center in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, I don't know much about it other than the fact that it was just dedicated, but I'll tell you this, that is one interesting, very high-tech auditorium. So I'm hoping, as I hope you are, that this center will be put to good use and a lot of people will continue to live instead of having more terrorist attacks going on around the world. And as you're seeing the procession in Riyadh right now, uh, we're actually going to just turn the page and we'll go on over to the next part of the Trump visit. And that is Israel. So we went right from you have a great uh, we went right from Saudi Arabia over to Israel, and he had some important meetings there. Let's hear uh, what he had to say with uh, the Israelis uh, on peace. But you have a great opportunity right now. There's a great feeling for peace throughout the Middle East. I think people have just had enough. They've had enough of the bloodshed and the killing. And I think you're going to see things starting to happen. We are praying for peace and we are pushing for peace for the last 100 years. And with God's help, somebody will bring us peace. This moment in history calls for us to strengthen our cooperation as both Israel and America face common threats from ISIS and other terrorist groups to countries like Iran that sponsor terrorism and fund and foment terrible violence, not only here, but all over the world. Together, we can work to end the scourge of violence that has taken so many lives here in Israel and around the world. Most importantly, the United States and Israel can declare with one voice 
that Iran must never be allowed to possess a nuclear weapon, never, ever, and must cease its deadly funding, training, and equipping of terrorists and militias. And it must cease immediately. On those issues, there is a strong consensus among the nations of the world, including many in the Muslim world. So uh, President Trump then headed out to the Western Wall, and he, he made history. Let's take a look at the video. And here, here, he, uh, here he is. First time in history that a, United, a sitting United States president had actually visited the Western Wall. It's also known as the Wailing Wall. Um, It was originally erected as part of the expansion of the Second Jewish Temple by Herod the Great. And it resulted in the encasement of the natural steep hill known to Jews and Christians as the Temple Mount. In a large rectangular structure topped by a huge flat platform, which created more space for the temple itself and its auxiliary buildings. What it doesn't show is its proximity to the Dome of the Rock, um, which is the Muslim uh, mosque that was built over the old temple. Temple Mount. Now, the term Western Wall and its variations are mostly used in a narrow sense for the section traditionally used by the Jews for prayer. It has also been called the Wailing Wall, referring to the practice of Jews weeping at the site over the destruction of the temples. Uh, during the period of the Christian Roman rule over Jerusalem, the Jews were completely barred uh, from the area, from Jerusalem, except to attend. Uh, Tisha B'Av, a na national day of mourning for the temples. And so it was, I've never been to Israel. I've not been to Jerusalem. Uh, I have studied that when I was in uh, my studies at Concordia University, St. Paul. We studied the second temple period of Jerusalem pretty intently. And it's really fascinating history uh, if you have not looked at it already. So in the few minutes we have left, of course, President Trump and Benjamin Netanyahu ended up meeting, and here's what they had to say about peace. In fact, you've taken a very strong position on Iran, different position, not only helps security, but also helps propel the possibility of reconciliation and peace between Israel and Iran. And that will help reconciliation between Israel and Palestine. Of course, not all uh, like to discuss before the cameras, but uh, I do look forward to our discussions because I think are pregnant with possibilities. Iran should be very grateful to the United States because Iran negotiated a fantastic deal with the previous administration, a deal that is unbelievable from any standpoint. Some people don't understand even how it could be even thought of. And instead of being thankful and saying thank you, because they were in serious trouble, I think they would have failed, totally failed, within six months. We gave them a lifeline, and we not only gave them a lifeline, we gave them wealth and prosperity. And we also gave them an ability to continue with terror and with all of the things they've been doing. Because no matter where we go, we see the signs of Iran, in the Middle East. No matter where we go, whether it's Syria, where we were really forced to shoot the 59 missiles a few weeks ago. Uh, no matter what area we're in, we see Yemen, Iraq. No matter where we are, we see the, uh, the signs, every sign, whether it's soldiers, whether it's money and guns, it's Iran. And instead of saying thank you to the United States, they now feel emboldened. Maybe they figure the deal was so good, 
We can do it every time. They can't do it, believe me. But it was a terrible, a terrible thing for the United States to enter that deal. And believe me, uh, Iran will never have a nuclear weapon that I can take. And then after meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu, President Trump met with Mahmoud Abbas. Let's take a look. I am committed to trying to achieve a peace agreement between the Israelis and the Palestinians, and I intend to do everything I can to help them achieve that goal. President Abbas assures me he is ready to work toward that goal in good faith, and Prime Minister Netanyahu has promised the same. And it's so interesting that our meeting took place on this very horrible morning of death to innocent young people. Peace can never take root in an environment where violence is tolerated, funded, and even rewarded. We must be resolute in condemning such acts in a single, unified voice. Peace is a choice we must make each day, and the United States is here to help make that dream possible for young Jewish, Christian, and Muslim children all across the region. In this spirit of hope, we come to Bethlehem, asking God for a more peaceful, safe, and far more tolerant world for all of us. I am truly hopeful that America can help Israel and the Palestinians forge peace and bring new hope to the region and its people. I also firmly believe that if Israel and the Palestinians can make peace, it will begin a process of peace all throughout the Middle East, and that would be an amazing accomplishment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And then he went to visit the Pope and then spoke in front of NATO. It's an attack on Manchester in the United Kingdom demonstrates the depths of the evil we face with terrorism. Innocent little girls and so many others were horribly murdered and badly injured while attending a concert. Beautiful lives with so much great potential, torn from their families forever and ever. The NATO of the future must include a great focus on terrorism and immigration, as well as threats from Russia and on NATO's eastern and southern borders. These grave security concerns are the same reason that I have been very, very direct with Secretary Stoltenberg and members of the Alliance in saying that NATO members must finally contribute their fair share and meet their financial obligations. But 23 of the 28 member nations are still not paying what they should be paying and what they are supposed to be paying for their defense. This is not fair to the people and taxpayers of the United States. And many of these nations owe massive amounts of money from past years and not paying in those past years. 2% is the bare minimum for confronting 
today's very real and very vicious threats. If NATO countries made their full and complete contributions, then NATO would be even stronger than it is today, especially from the threat of terrorism. We hope that the uh, president's trip bears some good fruit. It is Memorial Day weekend. Oh, I'm out of breath, sorry. And we're going to leave you with President Ronald Reagan on his thoughts on Memorial Day. If we look to the answer as to why for so many years we achieved so much, prospered as no other people on earth, it was because here in this land we unleashed the energy and individual genius of man to a greater extent than has ever been done before. Freedom and the dignity of the individual have been more available and assured here than in any other place on earth. The price for this freedom at times has been high, but we have never been unwilling to pay that price. Those who say that we're in a time when there are no heroes, they just don't know where to look. The sloping hills of Arlington National Cemetery with its row upon row of simple white markers bearing crosses or stars of David. They add up to only a tiny fraction of the price that has been paid for our freedom. Each one of those markers for Dallas is Pearson, a producer to the kind of hero I'm your host, Jeff earlier. Williams. They're You're watching North Star Oasis. And we want to wish you a happy Hill, and safe blessed Memorial Day. Omaha and Beach, reminding you that there's 213 shopping days left until Christmas. Thanks for watching. Tarawa, we'll see you next week. Pork Chop Hill, the Chosin Reservoir, and in a hundred rice paddies and jungles of a place called Vietnam. Under one such marker lies a young man, Martin Treptow, who left his job in a small town barber shop in 1917 to go to France.